Well, good morning. Welcome to Walden Community Church. My name is David, and we are in Romans chapter 5. And we've been saying through this series that Paul is a courtroom lawyer. He is presenting a case. He is arguing questions. And he's trying to spell out exactly what it is that Christians believe. Romans is a fantastic book to read if you would like to know what it is doctrinally that Christians believe. And he's writing this for recent Jews who've become Christians, but then also for Greek Gentiles who live in Rome. And here in chapter five, Paul's gonna give us a pep talk. <laughs> but as you're gonna see in a moment, maybe as a lawyer, he's not really the best at giving pep talks. So here we are, Romans five, verse one. Therefore, since we have been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Through him, we have also obtained access by faith into this grace in which we stand. And we rejoice in hope of the glory of God. Not only that, but we rejoice in our sufferings, knowing that suffering produces endurance and endurance produces character and character produces hope. Now, I'm sure that passage we just read was about hope, hopefully <laughs> inspiring us to uh, think about hope. And, and I heard the word hope, right? I heard it at least twice. It just doesn't feel hopeful. Why not? Well, I don't know. Paul was trying to show us how to get to hope, right? How to produce hope in our lives. But it was how he started. He said, this all starts with suffering. Oh, and he says, he says, learn to endure it, <laughs> right? Oh, you're suffering, learn to endure it. That's, that's nuts, right? Paul's nuts. I mean, how, how many of us here want to learn to endure suffering? Yeah, I, I, I don't want to learn to endure it. I want to learn to avoid it. I don't want a lesson in enduring suffering. I want a lesson in obtaining hope. Well, Paul says, hope doesn't come first. We probably remember Benjamin Franklin. He said that only two things in life are certain, death and taxes. Also not a good pep talk. <laughs> the existence of suffering is and has always been one of the greatest issues facing the Christian faith. Because we believe that God is good and powerful, and yet the question looms, then why is there suffering in the world? One side of the argument would be, if God is good, then he would want us to be happy, right? And if God is powerful, then he should want to fulfill all our dreams. And yet, we're not always happy. We're not always satisfied. So does that mean that God isn't good? Does that mean that God isn't powerful? Of course not, because we know God is good and we know he is powerful and yet suffering remains. So there must be another answer. Why do people suffer? We have good, strong Christian men and women in our church right now who are suffering, whose families are suffering. Why does this happen? The same question was asked of Jesus once. As Jesus passed by, he saw a man blind from birth. And his disciples asked him, Rabbi, who sinned, this man or his parents, that he was born blind? In other words, why is this man suffering? What's the cause of it? Was it because of something he did? Or was it a past sin from his parents? And look at Jesus' answer. He says, it was not that this man sinned or his parents, but that the works of God might be displayed in him. Jesus says, it's not because of anything we did. So why does suffering exist? Well, let's answer that question first. I think suffering exists in the world because we're all sinners, right? We are all sinners. I mean, that's gotta be number one. It's gotta be. Paul has pointed that out several times already in our study. And I find that whenever I suffer, 
a lot of the times I am suffering at my own hand. What do I mean by that? It means I made a bad choice, right? The, the world has physical and moral and spiritual laws. And when I break one of those laws, then I suffer. If I uh, drink and drive and crash my car, I did that to myself. If I have an affair, well, then I just crashed my marriage. And, and the other side of that is, it's the same reason that other people suffer, right? Because my sin doesn't just affect me, it affects other people. So if I drink and drive and crash my car, well, who did I crash into? Other people. So now other people suffer because of me. And that leads to the second reason. We also suffer because of other people's sin. When someone decides to hurt the innocent, or there's oppression, or slavery, or poverty, or starvation, or war, many of those issues are coming from other people's choices. We can suffer at our own hand. We can suffer at the hand of someone else. Each of us has a free will, and it can be just as much a curse as it is a blessing. But Pastor David, what about sickness? What about hurricanes and earthquakes? Those aren't the results of people's sin. True. And we do call those things acts of God. God could have stopped those things, or at least God could have, you know, shooed them away. We can look at that. Because I think not only is each of us a fallen individual, but we also live in a fallen world. Here's what Romans 5 says. Therefore, just as sin came into the world through one man and death through sin, and so death spread to all men because all sinned. For sin indeed was in the world before the law was given. But sin is not counted where there is no law, yet death reigned from Adam to Moses, even over those whose sinning was not like the transgression of Adam, who was a type of the one who was to come. The truth is, in the book of Genesis, the punishment for Adam and Eve's sin was labor, sweat, and pain. And God told Adam, from now on, you will fight the earth, and the earth will fight back. Which means floods, hurricanes, earthquakes, they are all part of living in a sinful world. Going back to Paul and his uh, pep talk <laughs> about hope, here in Romans 5, here we see a great man of God, our author. He is writing this and he is saying, endure suffering, endure it. And then he takes it even a step further and he says, rejoice in it. Now I know he's crazy, right? Rejoice in your suffering. Suffering is never a good thing. Suffering is terrible. Suffering is something that we tolerate. So what does Paul mean that we should rejoice in our suffering? and that eventually suffering leads to hope, because I think that's what Romans 5 is all about, okay? And there can be some reasons, I believe, that we can rejoice in our suffering. The first, I think, suffering always drives people closer to God. I mean, that's a reason to celebrate. You know, the week after 9-11, church attendance was up 6% all across America. Why? Because church can be a place where people feel safe, and when they suffer, they want to feel safe. They want to feel comforted. Going to a church can be comforting for so many people because you see the same faces every week, you sing amazing songs and hymns, and you hear a great message. And for a lot of people, that becomes routine, and routine can feel comfortable. And for many people, church is a place of refuge and peace. When we see this in the Bible as well, Luke 4 says, when the sun was setting, all those who had any that were sick with various diseases brought them to him. And he laid his hands on every one of them and healed them. The people took the sick and the infirm to Jesus. The people who are sick and wanted healing, wanted to be touched, they went to Jesus, right? That's what the text says. Jesus did not go door to door and ask if there was any sick people in the house. People who needed help people who needed healing, they sought Jesus out. They traveled miles to see him. Suffering drives people closer to God. 
Back in 1940, C.S. Lewis wrote a very challenging book called The Problem of Pain. And in it, he wrote, God whispers to us in our pleasures, speaks in our conscience, but shouts in our pains. It is his megaphone to rouse a deaf world. Suffering is a megaphone, he says. It, it speaks loudly and it, it tells the waking world to wake up. <laughs> because without suffering, what would happen? We would all be self-sufficient, right? We'd always be content. If you're not, you don't need God, you're fine. Without suffering, we wouldn't even need each other. So we certainly wouldn't need God. So when we suffer, we are driven to him. Suffering reminds us that we are lacking. It reminds us that we are not whole. And so first and foremost, I think suffering drives us back to our creator. Suffering says, I'm not perfect. I need healing. And so I go to Jesus. Second reason, I think suffering also forces us to grow. This is why Paul says in verse 3, not only that, but we rejoice in our sufferings, knowing that suffering produces endurance, endurance produces character, and character produces hope. Sure, we all want hope, that we do, but it doesn't happen overnight, and hope doesn't come first. But it is part of growth. That's what Paul is showing. Growth is a process, and each stage leads to the next. Suffering can hurt so much more without hope. So hope is something we look for when we suffer because hope says you're not alone. Hope says there's a light at the end of this tunnel. And this is what I think Paul wants to say. This is how, this is how a lawyer tells you that you can learn to endure suffering. Suffering produces endurance, endurance produces character, and character produces hope. What do I mean by that? How can we break all that down? Because I want to get to hope, right? I want to get to hope. I want this message to be about hope. So let's look at how we can grow. What's the first part there? Suffering produces endurance. Well, yeah, because what's the alternative? Give up, right? You either fight or you give up. And, and I know, sometimes when we suffer, we want to give up. Well, Paul knows how you feel. Look at what he said to the Corinthian church. For we do not want you to be unaware, brothers, of the affliction we experienced in Asia. For we were so utterly burdened beyond our strength that we despaired of life itself. Indeed, we felt that we had received the sentence of death. Translation, the situation was so bad, he says, me and my colleagues, we wanted to die. That doesn't sound hopeful. <laughs> it doesn't sound like rejoicing in my suffering. And if the passage ended there, that would be pretty bad. But look at the next few verses. In verse nine, he says, but, okay, watch this, watch this. Paul's gonna spell out the exact reason that they suffer. That was to make us rely not on ourselves, but on God who raises the dead. He delivered us from such a deadly peril and he will deliver us. On him, we have set our hope that he will deliver us again. Suffering produces hope because it shows us, like nothing else can, that we can handle more than we think if God is with us. And yes, suffering produces endurance. As we lean on God, he strengthens us with his power. Colossians 1.11 says, according to his glorious might, for all endurance and patience with joy. Next, Paul says that part of that same growth process is endurance produces character. What does he mean by that? Character here in the Greek is the word dokami, and it means a trait that's formed by a trial. In other words, it's not just character, it's character growth. Okay, so think about Think about character growth in the literary world, okay, in books, your, your favorite book. What makes the best stories? Because you, you, you don't want a main character to stay the same all the way through the book, do you? No, typically the main character is forced 
to overcome some obstacle, or to face some sort of trial. So there's suffering, and that suffering produces a change in that character. That, change, that character grows. That character becomes a better person by the end of the book. So why is it so important to show that character growth? Because readers want to see transformation. That's the whole point of a good story. Your character should not come out of the plot the same way they went in. If they do, well, then there's no story. Proverbs 1.5 says, Let the wise hear and increase in learning, and the one who understands obtain guidance. 1 Peter 1, In this you rejoice, though now for a little while, if necessary, you have been grieved by various trials, so that the tested genuineness of your faith, more precious than gold that perishes, though it is tested by fire, may be found to result in praise and glory and honor at the revelation of Jesus Christ. In other words, our patience grows when it is tested. Our kindness grows when it is tested. Our love grows when it is tested. Nobody grows when they're comfortable. So Paul says endurance produces character. And then character produces hope. There's a very similar passage found in the book of James. Count it all joy, my brothers, when you meet trials of various kinds, for you know that the testing of your faith produces steadfastness, and let steadfastness have its full effect, that you may be perfect and complete, lacking in nothing. Suffering says fight. It says rise up. It says overcome. Don't give up. Expect more. Expect better. And all along the road of suffering, you see a God who meets us in our suffering. And then our character is tested. Suffering reveals what is happening inside of us. It reveals what we believe and what we thought was real, and it transforms us and it forces us to grow. And when that happens, and we see Christ pulling us through all of it, and we see the new attributes of his character and his word reveals that to us, it gives us hope. And we need that to become something that we never could have been without it. So when Paul says we should rejoice in our sufferings, he's not crazy, he understands that our suffering is not meaningless. I believe that God can use our suffering for good. We see this example in the life of Joseph. (laughs) Joseph was rejected by his family, forced into slavery. He was tested, tried, unjustly imprisoned. He was left to rot in jail, forgotten by the world, but he never gave up hope. until one day he's freed and he's given the status of being second in charge of all of Egypt and the same people who hurt him, they are now bowing before him and Joseph is able to say to his abusers, as for you, you meant evil against me, but God meant it for good to bring about that many people should be kept alive. Joseph can now stand and rejoice in his suffering because God used it for good. Look, no one promised you an easy life when you became a Christian. No one promised you that you would never get sick, that you would never have problems, you would always choose the quickest line at the grocery store, your children would grow up to be healthy and perfect. None of us were promised a perfect life. Jesus, in fact, promises us the opposite. John 15, 18 says, If the world hates you, know that it has hated me before it hated you. 2 Timothy 3 says, Indeed, all who desire to live a godly life in Christ Jesus will be persecuted. See, the problem is, people assume that if God loved us, he'd create a world without suffering. But since there is suffering, well, Maybe that means that God doesn't love us. 
I mean, if he's not going to give us what we want and he's not going to protect us from pain, how is that loving? How is that an example of a loving God? The answer is found in the most popular verse in this chapter. Romans 5, 6. For while we were still weak at the right time, Christ died for the ungodly. For one will scarcely die for a righteous person, though perhaps for a good person one would dare even to die. But God shows his love for us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. That is one of the most loved verses in all the Bible. And many people miss the truth implied by the fact that Christ died for us while we were still sinners. Those steps there are important. God did not wait for us to clean up our act. He gave us his son while we were still actively rebelling against him. We had done nothing. We were still in the wrong. We were actively in the wrong. So salvation does not depend on our meeting God halfway or keeping the commandments or memorizing Bible verses or trying to be as good as we can. Chapter after chapter, Paul is showing us how important grace is. And he wants you to see it. When we suffer, we want God to relieve it. And we pray that he takes it away. And when he doesn't, we insist, well, God must not love me. God is punishing me for something I did. Are you kidding me? God blessed you and forgave you before you ever did one righteous thing. Paul knew that we would all experience suffering. And so he gives us the roadmap. He says, this is how you get through it. Take it from me. Learn from me. I've done it before. You can do it too. And he says, if you're ever suffering and you start to think that God doesn't love you, just remember that God gave his son for you. 1 John 3.16, John says something similar. This is how we know what love is. Jesus Christ laid down his life for us. And then a little later in John, it says, this is real love. Not that we loved God, but that he loved us and sent his son as a sacrifice to take away our sins. Paul says in the book of Galatians that the son of God loved me and gave himself for me. Listen, our, our present suffering, as big or as small as you might think it is, it has nothing to do with God's love for you. We all experience hardships. We all experience trials. I know, sometimes it looks like everybody else is winning and, and you're losing, but it's not the case. Trust me, this book, this Bible that you hold is a story about how God loves all and his love is unprecedented. <laughs> There's no other love that was more costly to its giver and less deserving of its recipient. When God the Father gave his son Jesus to die while we were still sinners, he gave everything, his own self, and there's no greater love than that. Giving his son, giving himself is the costliest gift of all. He paid the supreme price so that we would receive the greatest love greatest love. So, rejoice in your sufferings. Rejoice in your blessings. And the work of God will be displayed through you. Let's pray. Lord, at this time, we do remember those who suffer right now, people who are walking through illness, people who do not know where that pain is coming from, people who've received news of cancer. Lord, we pray for those families. We pray for that hurt. And we do pray for suffering. And we do pray that you would relieve suffering 
Of course, we pray for healing because you are the great healer. Of course, we pray for comfort and ease. But during this trial, Lord, teach us perhaps the most greatest and most difficult lesson that we can learn to rejoice in our suffering. We can rejoice because our suffering draws us to our knees and it draws us to you. It draws us to the realization that we are not perfect. It humbles us. It shows us that the, that the crutch we lean on is not made of wood. It is made of your flesh and blood that was given. Lord, may we find the comfort we need in you. And may we rejoice in knowing that we are your child. And so if the suffering is hours long, days long, or years long, comfort us just in the knowledge that we are loved by our Creator, loved by our God, loved when we had done nothing yet to redeem ourselves. No act of righteousness. You loved first and you loved all. Help us to find our joy in that, to rejoice in that, to look up, to sing, to smile, to lift hands, and to say thank you, Lord, for every good and perfect thing. Amen. Thanks for coming out and uh, going through the study of Romans with us. Of course, we'd always like to have you here with us. Uh, we have two services every Sunday, one at 9.30, which is a traditional service. We've got a choir, we sing hymns, we're gonna say the Lord's Prayer, have communion, do responsive readings. It's gonna be everything that you remembered church growing up. We also have an 11 o'clock service. It's a contemporary service. We have a worship team, come casual, come however you feel comfortable. And we also have a children's program from birth all the way through high school. We would love to be the church where you live. I'll see you guys next week. Bye.